That's insane. So those are things that I'm hoping that we, along this road, will help to further our commitment to how we can really start working together, going back to our respective communities, and start working in our own groups. Because when you think about any group, and we always want to label this from the Panthers to Masiosa gang members, and you know, we always got this fixed shape with these groups, groups, groups. But when we can get together and start saying we are more alike and we have more in common as far as middle class and wanting a decent life, decent education, decent housing for all of us as, as opposed to a few of us, because that's what's fueling this. What's fueling all, everything that we're dealing with, the new Jim Pro. When you guys see this, I'm going to show you guys some information as far as some stuff back in the day, man, how the stuff back in the day is still prevalent today. I mean, they just changed the name to the new Jim Crow. But it's still, if you want to be honest with you guys, it's, it's George Wallace said, segregation, non-segregation. George Wallace was, so, so let's get into this a little bit. I hope you guys are a little open to this. One of the main speakers was David Simon, the writer and producer who created The Wire and Treme, two television series that vividly portray the vast gap between rich and poor. Nothing drives that great divide home, he said, like our prison system. You're seeing the underclass hunted through a, a war on uh, dangerous drugs, allegedly, that is in fact merely a, a war on the poor and has turned us into the most incarcerative state uh, in the history of mankind at this point, in terms of just the sheer numbers of people we've put in, in American prisons. No other country on the face of the earth jails people at the, at the number and rate that we are. He's right, of course. During the past 30 years, the number of inmates in federal custody has grown by 800 percent, and half of them are serving sentences for drug offenses. According to the Sentencing Project, an advocacy group dedicated to changing how we think about crime and punishment, more than 60% of the people in prison are now racial and ethnic minorities. This book woke people up. The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander. She was my guest more than three years ago when the book was first published. An outstanding work of scholarship on how our war on drugs, our harsh mandatory minimum sentencing, and racism have converged to create a caste system in this country very much like the one under Jim Crow segregation laws. None of us at the time anticipated the powerful impact her book would have. It became a bestseller, spurred an even wider conversation about justice and inequality, and transformed Michelle Alexander from attorney and professor to an activist and advocate for an end to our dehumanizing penal system. Michelle Alexander, welcome. Thank you, thanks for having me. When the book came out, um, one reviewer called it the Bible of a social movement. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the apostles and the disciples and the church spreading? Have you seen the signs of a movement? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it has me so encouraged. As I travel from city to city, and I've been speaking in churches and at universities, I've been speaking inside prisons and reentry centers, just an incredible range. Um, of venues, I see over and over again um, people who are dedicating their lives now um, to ending the system of mass incarceration, to raising consciousness, people of faith who are organizing their church communities, um, organizing within mosques, um, holding study circles, holding film festivals, and then organizing and mobilizing their memberships or their congregations. I'm especially encouraged by formerly incarcerated people who are finding their voice um, and organizing to demand the restoration of their basic civil and human rights. Um, organizations like All of Us Are None, which has successfully um, you know, achieved ban the box um, legislation. And ban the box? Ban the box on employment applications. The, you know, box on employment applications that ask that dreaded question, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And of course, it doesn't matter whether you've been convicted of a felony a few weeks ago or 40 years ago. For the rest of your life, you're labeled a felon and then subject to legal discrimination for the rest of your life. And what are those ex-felons? 
What have they been telling you about what it's like to come out and try to get back into the society to which they have paid for their sins? I think it's just an extraordinary challenge. I mean, I think most people have this sense that when you're released from prison, well, yeah, life is hard. But if you really dedicate yourself, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, you know, knock on enough doors, you'll get that job, you'll get your life back together. It may be hard, but if you really try, you can do it. But what I've learned, you know, over the years from working with um, many formerly incarcerated people and forming close friendships with many people who've been released from prison, is that it, it's not just hard, it's often impossible. You're released from prison, often with, you know, maybe $20 in your pocket, have nowhere to sleep. You try to return home, maybe to your family who lives in pu public housing. Your family risks eviction in many places if they just even allow you to come home. Um, felons can be excluded from public housing. Whole families can risk eviction if they allow people with felonies to come home to them. Trying to get a job can be next to impossible. Um, you know, people say, well, well, they could get a job at, you know, Burger King or, you know, some minimum wage job. No, actually, you know, many low wage um, jobs are, for all practical purposes, off limits to people who have felonies. Hundreds of professional licenses are off limits to people who have felonies. In my state, in Ohio, until just recently, you could even get a license to be a barber uh, if you'd been convicted of a felony. Food stamps may be off limits to you if you've been convicted of a drug felony. Um, you know, what are people released from prison expected to do? Apparently what we expect them to do is to pay hundreds or thousands of dollars in fees, fines, court costs, accumulated back child support, which continues to accrue while you're in prison. And in a growing number of states, you're actually expected to pay back the costs of your imprisonment. <laughs> and paying back all these fees, fines, and court costs may be a condition of your probation or parole. And then if you're one of the lucky few, the very few who even manages to get a job straight out of prison, up to 100% of your wages can be garnished to pay back all those fees, fines, court costs. Um, How do you explain this, given the fact that this is a society that celebrates uh, second chances for politicians in particular, <laughs> a society that is built around the theme of renewal, born again, mm -hmm. uh, and yet doesn't extend that same act of forgiveness to people who have paid for their sins? Well, we say we're a society that supports second chances, but in reality, we're not. And I think um, the reason to fully understand what's happened in this country with respect to mass incarceration, you have to look back at least 40 years um, to um, the law and order movement that was born um, in the midst of the civil rights movement. You know, when civil rights advocates were beginning to violate segregation laws and sit in at lunch counters and um, desegregate trains and buses, um, violating what they believed were unjust laws, um, segregationists said, you know, this is leading to the breakdown of the respect for law. We need law and order in this country. Um, and the call for law and order was in direct response to um, the civil rights movement and the nonviolent civil disobedience um, the protesters were engaged in. Um, but this law and order movement began to take on a life of its own um, as crime rates began to rise in urban areas and um, some politicians began to say, you know, this rising crime is a symptom of this attitude of lawlessness that is spreading through the nation. We need to get tough. We need to crack down. We need law and order. And as I've documented at great length in the book and many other political scientists and historians have as well, the Get Tough movement and the war on drugs really is traceable to a backlash against the gains of African Americans in the civil rights movement and a radical shift in mentality that occurred where as a nation we ended the war on poverty and declared the war on drugs. A wave of punitiveness really swept the nation on the heels of the civil rights movement. And this attitude um, has infected not only our criminal justice system, but our education system that now has a zero tolerance policy for school discipline infractions right. um, and has led to this prison building boom, unlike anything the world has 
ever seen. How have mandatory minimum sentences contributed to that? Well, mandatory minimum sentences ensures that you will get the harshest possible sentence um, under law, the mandatory minimum sentence. And so it shifts power to the prosecutors so that prosecutors can then say to you, will you take this plea or else you're going to get this harsh mandatory minimum sentence? Um, and it gives prosecutors the power um, to, you know, encourage plea deals. Um, you know, in the federal system, I think 97 to 98 percent of all, you know, charged cases result in a plea, not a trial, because people are terrified of facing these harsh mandatory minimum sentences. And it ensures that it's up to the prosecutor, not the judge, um, you know, what kind of a sentence you receive. And mandatory minimum sentences has a lot to do with the exponential increase in our prison population in the United States. Um, and today, you know, even in this era of Obama, in this time of supposed colorblindness, um, we now have created a system of mass incarceration, a penal system unprecedented in world history. We have the highest rate of incarceration in the world, dwarfing the rates of even highly repressive regimes like Russia or China or Iran. Um, and the majority of the increase um, in incarceration in the United States have been among impoverished people of color who, once they're swept into the system, are then stripped of the very rights supposedly won in the civil rights movement. Um, and yet the topic of mass incarceration uh, has been one, you know, that has been rarely raised. Is there research that confirms that the backlash is against black criminals or against criminals, just crime? Well, there is. There's an enormous amount of research that suggests that the backlash and the punitive impulse was not simply in response to crime, but was uh, much more deeply connected um, to racial attitudes, racial fears and anxieties. And in fact, you know, the political strategists who conceived of the Get Tough movement and the war on drugs quite deliberately um, used not so subtle racial appeals and racial code language um, with the purpose of trying to exploit both conscious and unconscious racial biases and stereotypes for political gain. Um, the Southern strategy. Um, By which Richard Nixon was elected president. Yes, yes. The basis of the Southern strategy was using these kind of racially coded get tough appeals on issues of crime and welfare to appeal to poor and working class whites, particularly in the South, who are anxious about, threatened by, resentful of many of the gains of African Americans in the civil rights movement. And to be fair, I think we have got to acknowledge that poor and working class whites really had their world rocked by the civil rights movement. Um, you know, wealthy whites could send their kids to private schools, um, give their kids all of the advantages um, that wealth has to offer. But poor and working class whites in the South, many of whom were themselves struggling for survival, um, who were desperately poor, often illiterate, um, they were the ones who might have to ship their kids across town to go to a school they believed were inferior. It was them, they uh, who were suddenly forced to compete on equal terms for limited jobs with this whole group of people they've been taught their whole lives to believe were inferior to them. And this state of affairs did create an enormous amount of fear, resentful, resentment and anxiety, and an enormous political opportunity. What about now? How do you see that playing out? Well, I see it most obviously in the immigration debate. Today, we see that this fear of immigrants coming across the border to take jobs and uh, to take educational resources and who are going to drain the uh, tax base of your county, these fears that they are coming to take from you um, is leading and has led to another sort of get tough movement. Um, get tough on them, those immigrants who have violated the law by crossing over. And this wave of punitiveness now directed towards immigrants is leading to the same kind of indifference 
um, towards their basic humanity um, that we have seen in the war on drugs and the Get Tough movement that led to the rise of mass incarceration. I mean, race has been used as a wedge again and again um, throughout American history to divide um, the lower classes, if you will, and um, to create uh, an environment um, in which poor and working class people are pit against one another. But that does not mean that, you know, all or even most yeah. poor and working class white folks are harboring any conscious racial resentments. I know that there are those folks out there for sure. But I think much of it um, lies in the unconscious stereotypes and fears and biases that we all have within us um, that get exploited in these moments where groups are scapegoated um, and fears are stoked, um, resulting in you know, the emergence of these new systems. I mean, we are having mass deportation today at the same time as we are having mass incar incarceration. Mass deportation, I must say, by a black president. Absolutely. It's one of the great ironies, just as it's, you know, an irony that the greatest escalation of the drug war was under President Clinton, who, you know, many African Americans called our first black president. <laughs> I remember that. And it was President Clinton, you know, a Democrat, um, who escalated the drug war far beyond what President Reagan or President Nixon had even dreamed possible. And it was the Clinton administration that championed laws banning drug offenders even from federal financial aid for schooling you know, upon their release, um, banning drug offenders and people with criminal convictions from, you know, public housing. Um, you know, to a large extent, many of the rules, laws, policies, and practices that now constitute this caste-like system um, were championed by a Democratic uh, president and administration desperate to win back those so-called white swing voters, well, the folks who had defected from the Democratic Party in the wake of the civil rights. I was going to ask you, what do you think is the dynamic that drove Clinton and now drives Obama? Is it, is it to satisfy the base they think most hostile to them? I think so. And, you know, what I find most unfortunate, though, um, of the politics that have developed over the years, the politics of trying to appease, um, you know, poor and working class whites, not by building explicitly multiracial, multiethnic, you know, coalitions and alliances that encourage solidarity across racial and class lines, but instead by kind of tossing these um, symbolic bones, um, you know, saying, well, we're, we're escalating the drug war, we're getting tough on them, don't you feel better now? Um, we're willing to get tough by deporting even more immigrants than ever have been deported before. Don't you feel better now? Um, we fall into the trap of really playing to people's, you know, baser fears and instincts rather than um, risking perhaps some short-term losses, um, but building the kind of unity and the kind of solidarity across race and class lines, which I believe would help to ensure a much more stable foundation for the kind of multiracial, multiethnic, inclusive democracy that I would hope for. Um, which is why my great hope does not lie with President Obama right. or our elected politicians, no matter how well-meaning or well-intentioned they may be. You have talked recently in um uh, uh, way different from how you were talking three and a half years ago. You've been talking about moving out of your own lane. What are you suggesting? Yeah, well, you know, right around the anniversary of the March on Washington, I found myself doing a fair amount of internal reflection about um, my own role um, at this time in building the kind of movement that I would hope for, for social justice. And what I had to admit to myself is that for the last few years, you know, I have spent all of my working hours talking about mass incarceration and trying to raise consciousness about what has happened in this country, how we've managed to birth a caste-like system again, you know, that there are more African Americans under correctional control today in prison or jail, on probation or parole, than were enslaved in 1850, that we've 
we've created this vast new system again and to try to raise consciousness so that people would wake up to this reality. And I realized that as well-intentioned as all that work was, it was leading me to a place of relatively narrow thinking, that I wasn't connecting the dots between other kinds of social injustices that are occurring here in the United States and abroad to the work that I was committed to and the cause that I had been committed um, There was a larger breakdown of democracy that affected more people than African Americans in prison or immigrants being deported. You're saying that the system is broken down. Absolutely. The entire system has been broken down and it's really, I think, um, at its root about a failure on our part to develop a moral consensus about how we treat one another. Um, you know, for me, I have to care. If I care about a young man serving, you know, 25 years to life for a minor drug crime, if I care about him and care about his humanity, ought I not also care equally about a young woman who's facing deportation back to a country she hardly knows and had lived in only when as a child and can barely speak the language and ought I not be as equally concerned about her fate as well? Ought I not be equally concerned about a family um, whose loved ones were just killed by drones in Afghanistan? Um, ought I not care equally for all? And that really was Dr. King's um, insistence at the end of his life that we ought to care about the Vietnamese as much as we care and love our people at home. So I think we ought to commit ourselves to building a human rights movement in this country, a human rights movement for education, not incarceration, for jobs, not jails, a movement that will end all these forms of legal discrimination against people released from prison, discrimination that denies them basic human rights to work, to shelter, to education, to food. Hey, I want to ask a question. What did you guys hear? What is one thing that you guys heard? So we have a conversation. What did you guys hear? In 1850. In 1850, what happened? 1850, what happened? She mentioned that there are more people incarcerated now, persons of color incarcerated, than were in enslavement. In 1850, y'all get this. In 1850, and today, today there's over 7 million people that are under some form of the justice system. Over seven million. I said before, when there's no more cotton pick, when there, when you think about manual labor, or when you think about disposable people, Trayvon Martin was disposable. Tamir Rice, think about it, guys. If we live in a society, where we can allow, this is uh, Eric Donald. Eric Donald was choked to death by the police. And this is in the tear. There's nothing different, basically, because all life should be pressured. All life, guys. When we live in a society that can accept and promote, meaning seriously promote it, and that's why it's so important that our white brothers and sisters, because if you think about it, growing up, James Baldwin said in 1937, he said all he could remember growing up is that the worst thing you could be is a black person in America. If you think about all your life, you feeling that you are less than, and you think about what's going on today in our community today, because things that happened then, the whole reason that we are in our situation today is because we didn't do, we didn't do right in the past. Do you know there's some simple things that they tried to do with the Freedmen Bureau, meaning those enslaved people, post-slavery, reconstruction, allow people to vote, to be at the table when you are making the rules, when you are giving out land, 
We have people come in this country that was given land, given land, didn't earn it, didn't work for it, was given land. And right now, we have people that's been in this country less than 30 years. We got immigrants that have been in this country less than 30 years. Black people have been in this country for almost 500 years. And when you think about in 1863 and 1865, Black people wealth was 0.1%. Today that wealth is a half a percent. Now think about that, man. Since 1863 and 1865. Back to what I said, America is a business. This country was founded and was, was taken from some people that was already here to develop business. And the business was what? Cotton. Or rum at one time, cotton, sugar. Yes. But it's always the commodities. How can I exploit the concept of capitalism, guys? Is I can exploit those that have no power, and the few that has power can control those other people that's in that environment to say, that, well, we are proud of this, so I'm going to take advantage of my white ones. So I'm privileged. And that's what we got to start working on. Now, when you think about the Civil War, so four million people now are competing for jobs. So that's when the unions will start. And at one time in the unions, black people couldn't get no union. And you think about it, most of the black people had skills because they were doing all the work. But then you're going to say, it's your fault. And you can't read and write because you have a system that's designed. If you get caught burning anything, you will get killed. And then you say, why are we in our situation that we are today? This caste system. Mitch McConnell then said, we're going to do all we can to make sure President Barack Obama be a one-term president. In the history of this country, even if you're from any different political party, you should not want your president to fail. That's insane. Why would you want your president to fail? If he's a human being and you care about your country, if you're saying, I'm going to take my country back or the Tea Party and all these other kind of aberrations, and a lot of times, man, that's why people, we, we our hearts be in the right direction to some degree, just like the affirmative action in Michigan, how that was just totally butchered. If, if you finish the race and I'm just starting the race, I need some help. If you didn't finish the race, I'm just getting at the starting block. Then you're going to tell me it's your fault because you're black and you're lazy and you're over everything and you have too many babies.